Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pasadena Central Library. My name is Tim McDonald. I'm the Deputy Director of Pasadena Public Library, and I'm thrilled to invite you to tonight's program. If you haven't already, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. The end of our program tonight, if you haven't already, books are available for sale, thanks to the generous support of the Friends of the Pasadena Public Library. Yeah. Awesome. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our library director, Michelle Pereira. You're going to be trapped. No, I'm going to take the mic up. Oh, you are? Okay. Oh my gosh, she's so much taller than I am. Oh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. We are so excited to have this event here when we found out that Mr. Connolly was coming to visit. Everyone here was just, well, practically screaming, actually. We were so thrilled. Um, we have a great evening for you, and I'm thrilled to see we our men in uniform here in front with our chief of police. When our police chief Perez here found out we were having Michael Connolly, he said, I think you're gonna need some extra security there, so. <laughs> We're gonna show up. I'm like, okay, that's great. So actually, you know, like uh, Tim said, we are very thankful to our friends of the library and Romans for helping us out with this event. Um, since the book just came out on Tuesday, there's a lot of demand, obviously. And you may not know this, but um, there's a library conference in town, and there are about 2,000 librarians running around Pasadena right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the convention center, and Mr. Connolly is going to be joining us there later. So, I'm going to get this started, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about his career. And I'm also going to introduce, um, we have two authors, obviously Mr. Connolly, and we have Steph Cha, who's going to be in conversation with him. And she's the author of Your House Will Pay and the Juniper Song Crime Tril Trilogy. She's an editor and critic whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. A native of the San Fernando Valley, she lives in Los Angeles with her husband and her two basset hounds. I know, so maybe we'll find out about that later too. And as you can imagine, with an author that has written as many books as he has written, 30 three, including this one. Um, oh, and something like 74 million copies sold. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy bio, but I think it's worth it. Michael Connolly was born in Philadelphia on June tw uh, July 21st, 1956. He moved to Florida with his family when he was 12 years old. Michael decided to become a writer after discovering the books of Raymond Chandler while attending the University of Florida. Once he decided on his direction, he chose a major in journalism and a minor in creative writing, a curriculum in which one of his teachers was novelist Harry Cruz. After graduating in 1980, Mr. Connolly worked at newspapers in Daytona Beach and Fort Lauderdale, primarily specializing in the crime beat. In Fort Lauderdale, he wrote about police and crime during the height of the murder and violence wave that rolled over South Florida during the so-called cocaine wars. In 1986, he and two other reporters spent several months interviewing survivors of a major airline crash. They wrote a magazine story on the crash and the survivors, which was later shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. The magazine story also moved Mr. Connolly into the upper levels of journalism, landing him a job as a crime reporter for the Los Angeles Times, one of the largest newspapers in the country. And <laughs> I still get my subscription at home, by the way. And bringing him to the city of which his literary hero Chandler had written. Michael is the best-selling author of now 33 novels and one work of nonfiction, with over 74 million copies of his book sold worldwide and translated into 40 languages. He is one of the most successful working writers today. His very first novel, The Black Oak Echo, 
won the prestigious Mystery Writers of America Edgar Award for Best First Novel Mystery Writers, excuse me, the Black Echo won the prestigious Mystery Writers of America Edgar Award for Best First Novel, oh my gosh, in 1992. In 2002, Clint Eastwood directed and starred in the movie adaptation of Connolly's novel, Blood Work. In March of 2011, the movie adaptation of his number one best-selling uh, novel, The Lincoln Lawyer, hit the theaters worldwide, starring Matthew McConaughey and Mickey Heller. And now we come to where we are today. Michael is the executive producer of Bosch. An Amazon Studios original drama based on the best-selling character Harry Bosch, starring Titus Welliver. Bosch streams on Amazon Video. He is the creator and host of a podcast, Murder Book. He's also the executive... Hmm. He is also the executive producer of the documentary films Sound of Redemption, The Frank Morgan Story, and Tales of an American. He spends his time between California, how lucky are we, and Florida. Ladies and gentlemen, enough of me, Mr. Michael Connolly and Steph Cha. safe up here. <laughs> so. Hello. Can you, you can hear us all right? Yep. Good. All right. Okay. Um, well, I'm very, very excited to be here with Michael Connolly. Um, as an LA reader and writer, I mean, this is, this is a pretty sweet gig. <laughs> um, so let's jump right into it. Um, I love the Night Fire. I mean, I love the, I love the, Ballard and Bosch series. Um, I think Ballard is such a wonderful, vivid character. And since she's your newest series protagonist, I thought we might start with her. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about where she came from? Um, what's, what's interesting to me about Ballard is that, um, you know, I've been writing about Harry Bosch for uh, more than 25 years. And Harry was a, is a descendant of many influences, many real detectives I know, real police officers a lot of uh, literary influences and even movies and TV. So he kind of comes from all over. And Ballard is completely opposite. She's a single source inspiration, I guess you call it. It's a real detective with LAPD uh, named Missy Roberts. And uh, I've known her for a long time. She's, she's one of the detectives that helps me with my books and, uh, and then carried that over into being a consultant on the TV show. Um, so spend, you know, I've had breakfast with her. That's usually how I do my research. It's not going to crime scenes, believe it or not. It's having breakfast with detectives. And uh, one of those breakfasts she let drop that earlier in her career as a younger detective, she uh, worked the midnight shift uh, and, and started talk, telling stories about it, how it's a different city at night here and how um, the detective on the late show um, has to handle anything that comes up, you know. So one night it could be a murder, the next night it could be a missing dog. You know, it's, it's highs and lows, and it's a, a lot of different things. And that just struck me at, at the right time, I guess, in my writing life that I was kind of looking for something that would have um, variety to it. Because, um, you know, with Bosch, it's always murder, 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 you know. And I wanted uh, to, to change it up a little bit. Did, when she was working the late show, was that in Hollywood Division? Uh, no, it was, um, I forget which one it was. it was. I think it was Rampart, but it was in Hollywood. Ooh, Rampart, uh, Rampart uh, is as, I'm sure that was just as happening. Yeah. Um, why did you choose the Hollywood Division? Uh, because I felt more comfortable there, and I thought there would be a, uh, a more interesting variety of, of things I could get into. A lot of the anecdotal stories that um, uh, are in the books that uh, Ballard encounters are true stories that most of them I can come from uh, Detective Roberts, but they also come from other detectives I know and so forth. 
And uh, I don't know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm obviously aware where Hollywood is and people's uh, imaginations around the world, and so I think that weighed into it as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good choice, and there's such a variety of characters that you meet in every book, and a variety of cases. I think that's, I think that's part of what makes these books really fun, um, particularly once Bosch got involved, the kind of interweaving of multiple storylines um, and having them go all, in this, all at the same time in this way that they kind of link together thematically, but they don't like perfectly dive to, dovetail together in a way that would be unrealistic. I, I, I find it really enjoyable. Well, I'm trying to, you know, I'm a former journalist, and I, I, I'm trying, I'll never get 100% accurate to what it's like to be a, uh, a police officer, a detective, and what their world's like, but I'm trying to get close to it. And they always have lots of balls in the air, and, and I just thought this situation with Ballard would be perfect so that she would have like a case of real importance and something that really motivates her. You know, the book, The, the Night Fires, really means her, the, the internal fire that she builds on a case. And then there'd be the, the stuff that like, you know, no one would believe this if, the, if, you know, it's too weird to be true type of stories that happen in Hollywood and other areas around here. Yeah, but there, another thing about Ballard is she's, she's an LAPD officer like Bosch has been, but she navigates the, the department in an entirely different way. She's, she's younger, she's a woman, she's, she's Hawaiian and she's mixed race. Um, and in The Late Show, something that has carried over from that first book throughout the series is that she has this nemesis, um, Lieutenant, now Captain Olivas, who sexually harassed her at a party, and she has been, the reason she landed on The Late Show is sort of as punishment for kicking up dust about that incident. Um, I, there's this great quote from this book. Um, Ballard knew she could outwit and out-investigate him all she wanted, but he would still always have that unnameable thing he had taken from her. I found that very powerful. Um, so, so Bosch has always had his own concerns, but they don't look like Ballard's. Can you talk about navigating LAPD life and politics with this character as your guide? Um, a lot of it comes from, you know, spending time, and I, I guess you call it research, with um, uh, the de you know Detective Roberts and aspects of, of you know I've known uh, her partner and uh, previous partners of hers um, in the department for a long time, and she just talks in, in a different way about what she has to do to prove herself, to continually prove herself, and so forth. And um, you, you know it's like a you know a tougher road. I mean I have a. I just weirdly, I liken it to my own daughter who um, works on the TV show Bosch, and she has my last name. So she says, I have to work harder than anybody there because I have your last name. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> you know, and, and Missy Roberts has to work harder than all the other detectives, and then even still, she doesn't get credit, um, as, at least in my opinion, that she deserves. And you know that's a motivating thing, and I, and at the same time, in, in the real life situation, I'm, I'm I feel bad about, but I know oh I can take that into my book, and that's um, grounds for some really good drama and uh, and uh, motivation for this character to, to push her to to the uh, points that she goes. I have to say, um, I, you know, I read The Late Show when it came out, and. Um you know, reading, reading a lot of your Bosch novels and just knowing that you wrote all these books about men, I was very impressed with how, how well and how realistic uh, she came off on the page. Um, well, she, I, you know, I still feel like I'm a reporter. I'm not a genius when it comes to this stuff. Um, I, have, I have her, you know, she, so she, she uh, vetted every draft of that book, gave me you know, told me where I was wrong, and this is what I would do, this is what I would think, this is what I would say. And so that, um, that came through in the book, and so um, I feel like the credit's hers, not mine. I mean, you still write the books. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk about Ballard and Bosch as a team. Um, they have really wonderful chemistry as partners. May I ask you to switch seats because your mics aren't picking up enough sound for everyone to hear? Oh, yeah, happy oh. to. <laughs> That's going to cure it? <laughs> Is this better? So you're talking to your mic, looking at him. Okay. Oh, I see. So where is mine? You're good. All, okay. right. All right. Here we go. 
<laughs> okay. So um, Bosch is now this outsider to the department. Um, as, of, as of the events of Dark Sacred Night, he isn't even a reserve officer anymore. Um, and Ballard is on this midnight shift where she isn't being supervised that closely. Um, they make this w wonderful <laughs> they, they make a really good team. Um, it's, not, it's not immediately intuitive when you think about it, but like they, they click from the beginning um, and they have, a, they have a great rhythm. So what do, you, what do you think it is that makes them such a fantastic team? Well, I think it starts with um, they have, you know, Bosch is relentless and she's fierce. And to me, that's pretty much the same thing. I always kind of boil characters down to uh, one word, and that's my one word description for them, and it's very close. So, so it's kindred souls you start with, and then just on a, um, a level of, of what they do and where they are in life, he's an outsider, she's an insider. Um, she is a badge, he doesn't. So they, they can do different things that perhaps the other one can't do. And um, I think there's even something symbiotic about one works at night, the other one sleeps at night, you know? And uh, so I, I just think it, it matches up pretty good. And, um, you know, I think there's still, you know, two books into working together. It's, it's still not clear. They're still not completely trusting each other. But I think by the end of this book, you can see that the main thing is that Bosch had, you know, Bosch is hitting a wall of um, realism. He's, uh, I'm stuck with, uh, in my books, earlier books, stupidly, I said he was born in 1950. <laughs> I was <glad> so, <laughs> um, you know, so, so he's 69 years old this year. So he's, he's approaching a point where people are gonna be wondering like, well, how accurate is this if this 78 year old guy is running around? <laughs> so, um, so, so he's, he's, he's definitely looking for uh, someone who can carry on his mission. He sees it in her soul. He knows that she carries the same kind of uh, feelings about what they do, the, the idea that it's a mission, not a job. And uh, so I think by the end of this book, and this is not a big spoiler, it's not said, it's just something hopefully the reader will get. He knows that this is the, the person that's gonna carry on after me. So. He, uh, he, and he also kind of mentors her while not being like, she doesn't, she, he doesn't like, uh, she calls him dad at one point um, because he is on her about getting sleep. And uh, so there's this, there's this push pull where like, he's her mentor, but she's not actually like treat, she's, it, does, it doesn't have that like power dynamic. Um, and, uh, he, but, I, but he teaches her about the fire inside, which I, which I assume thematically goes with the night fire, you know, cultivating that fire, um, that advice to take every case personally, um, I, I found that pretty compelling. Um, speaking of Bosch's aging, I did want to ask you about that. So he's almost 70. His health has been steadily deteriorating in the background for, for you know, several books now. Um, he even... I, I guess I'll get to the, the leukemia later, but um, he's, he's, not doing, he's not doing that great. He has a new knee now. Um, so how, how do you deal with an aging Bosch? Do you see Bosch doing his Bosch thing until he dies, and, or would uh, Maddie kill him first? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, it's like a big note to self next time create a character that's <laughs> younger than you. Um, <laughs> You know, Bosch is several years older than me, and that that was a mistake, probably. But um, that's so. Ballard is many years younger than me, so I think it will um, she'll outlive me. Um, but I, you know, it, it's it's not something that's heavy on my mind. It's just it's just it's just real life. You know, mm -hmm. um, I know people his age and younger that have gotten new knees, but it's, it's actually been a positive thing in their lives. And, you know, we meet Bosch in the very first page here, and he's, I think he's one month uh, or five weeks post-op on a new knee, so he's still walking with a cane. But um, before the book's over, he has discarded the cane, and he's, uh, he's, moving, uh, he's moving forward. And, uh, you know, and I think he feels 
that um, it just, uh, and obviously there's no romance between him and Ballard, but he almost feels like she's making him young again is what I, yeah. is the feeling that I get so that he's, re I, you know, my hope is that people will realize he's ready to, to keep working and I don't have to worry about the end of the series or anything like that. <laughs> How do you balance the two leads? Uh, do you worry about one upstaging the other? I know in um, Dark Sacred Night, you kind of have like, I, I don't want, it, this isn't a spoiler, spoiler, but you know, they kind of save each other at various points in the book. Um, do, you, do you think about that um, and like in a conscious way? I, I did more in, in Dark Sacred Night. In this book, I really believe it was Ballard's book and so I didn't really care if, if she was on on, in more page or narrating or carrying the story in more than half the book. Uh, I just, it didn't matter to me. And, you know, I think at the moment, because she's, she's the new shiny thing in my writing life, I really like writing about her. Um, not that I don't like writing about Bosch, but um, I've been writing about Bosch for a long time. And so the, the new thing is, is more exciting to me. So I, I think I kind of pushed it towards her. True heroes are hard to come by, I guess. He, he says that to her towards the end of the book. And um, he's referring to a former mentor of his who throughout the events of the book, you find you know, he's done them some things, as many people have, that are questionable. Um, and, it, and it makes him come to question, um, question who this person was. Um, do you think of these two as heroic and because I, I, th I think of them as heroic, but I, but I wondered about that because that came out of Bosch's mouth. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, it's, it's that old, uh, you know, Raymond Chan thing about tarnished knights and so forth. So, yeah, they're heroic. I think there's a noble bargain in what someone, the real cops and what someone like uh, Bosch and someone like um, uh, Ballard do, you know, like, it's, it's thankless if you do it right. And, um, you know, if you do it wrong, then everyone's gonna know about it, but they still do it. Um, and uh, they still care about victims. And, you know, mm -hmm. not that I'm any expert, but, you know, of the detectives and, and police officers I've known over the years, there's, there's some that it's a craft and a job, and there's some that it's a mission. And I, you know, I wanna write, I'm, I'm not saying one's worse or one, one's better. Um, it's just the way it is. Um, I just find the, the ones that carry it as a mission, it's a dangerous way to do it because mm -hmm. you, you can get that darkness inside you and it can uh, do something to you. And that's the risk and, and that's what I like writing about, people who take that risk. And Ballard and Bosch both do that. And so, so in my book, they're heroes. Yeah, and that, um, the wear and tear of taking every case personally. I mean, especially across so many books. Um, I wanted to ask you about Bosch's evolution and the various changes that he's had professional and otherwise throughout the series. Um, because he's not even a police officer anymore. Um, and this has been true, to, true before, and it's true again. Um, he doesn't put out a shingle, but he's a private investigator now, right? Like, mm -hmm. he's working, and he's working unofficially with a p police officer. You know, I, I often think of, because I've written a few PI novels, I think of PI novels and police police procedurals, police novels as distinct because like as genres, they often do different things, the outsider versus the insider. And Bosch has kind of, he's been both. And even mm -hmm. now he's kind of both. Um, so where do you think this leaves him both in his life and w within the crime genre? Well, I don't think about where it leaves him in the crime genre, but um, you know, like where, whether he should be classified as a private eye or not, he, he is, He's acting as one, but he's not an official one. Like yeah. he works for Mickey Haller in this book for On the Case, and and then he takes on this own case on his own. Um, I just think um, you know um, you know maybe he's a hybrid. But I think from day one, from the very first book, I always thought of him as an outsider with an insider's job, and now he's just an outsider because he doesn't have that that badge and uh, and so forth that um, is a symbol of the state. You know, um, this book also does some pretty interesting things with, um, you know, and I know you have Mickey Haller as the series character also, um, but, but Bosch does some work for, for Mickey, for Haller, and, um, and he has police officers, including Ballard, accuse him of her working for the dark side, mm -hmm. um, because Mickey Haller is working in his capacity as a criminal defense attorney. 
Um, yeah, so we see, we see Bosch take some questionably legal actions, but while also keeping his allegiance to the truth and even due process by helping Haller. Um, can you talk about Bosch's code um, and whether it's been consistent over, over, the, over the course of his career? Like, have you, do you have a defined idea of this? Well, his, his code is everybody counts or nobody counts, and to me, that's an ideal. And so the second part of your question, has he been loyal to that through, through uh, his career and all, through all these books? No, I mean, he's fallen short, and there, you know, I can think of a book, um, A Dark That's More Than Night, which I think is where Bosch you know, kind of tripped and fell into the abyss. But um, like I said, it's an ideal, and it's always out there, and so there's always a, a redemptive journey um, you know, I reached this point in writing my books where I knew I could keep writing about Harry Bosch if I wanted to. Um, and that gives you a lot of freedom. So you can have a book where he doesn't live up to that ideal. And then you can come back with a book where he totally does and he kind of redeems himself. And, uh, you know, I, I just think, you know, that's a um, conceit of fiction when, uh, and superhero dumb and stuff like that when, when people live by this code and it never, they never falter. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather write about somebody who, uh, who knows that's how he should live and how he wants to live but doesn't always get there. Have fans ever been really mad at anything Bosch did? <laughs> at Bosch? Um, I don't know about, I mean, they've been mad at stuff I've done in the books. <laughs> two, two people or two Bosch, but I don't know if they've been upset with him. Um, you know, I think his, his uh, motives are true. He just, uh, you know, he's like everybody else. He has flaws and, and misses the mark sometimes, but uh, he, you know, he'll live the fight another day. Um, so I wanted to go back to his health because Bosch has now been diagnosed with myeloid leukemia as a result of CCM exposure in the Overlook, which you published in 2007. Um, Leukemia is a serious one. Uh, I, I, I hope he recovers very shortly. Uh, <laughs> He's got it under control. <laughs> Did you always think you might use that plot point down the road? I guess, and as a broader question, as you write all of these novels, are you constantly planning ahead of the books that you're writing? And how do you keep track of like the master plan for this whole well, universe? Yeah, I don't really have a master plan. Like, I don't even know when I will write about him next or what the story will be. I know he's not in my next book. I'm doing something completely different. Um, but at the same time, I don't have a master plan. I knew when the events of the Overlook occurred, he was going to have, they could have um, ramifications down, down the road. And, at the, and I was also thinking, like, if they, if they don't, if he doesn't have ramifications from that down the road, health ramifications, um, you know, am I cheating? Because I, I, you know, he got dosed pretty good with some bad materials, um, you know, whatever it was. Would you say 2007? So 12 <laughs> years ago, you know, I started thinking in recent years, like, what would that mean? And I went to the um, doctors and so forth who, who helped me with that book back in 2007 and I, I said what, what could he expect now 12, 10, 12 years later and, and that was the answer. So It's a good thing to have in your back pocket if you're planning to write a book in 12 years. <laughs> Some yeah. dangerous exposure. Um, so Bosch is working on both cold cases and current cases and, he, and that's been kind of what he's been doing for the last several books. Um, can you talk about the appeal and strategy for you behind writing a cold case as opposed to a current case? I'm sorry, yes, I didn't, what, the strategy? The strategy and also what appeals to you about it. Okay, um, well, cold cases have always appealed to me. I just, I just love them because to me it's a time, time travel device yeah. and you can go back in time and explore what was going on in you know, <laughs> the city or in society at a certain time. And, uh, you know, I just love that aspect of it, you know, and, and how, and you can show how the world has changed or, or not changed. And so I'm always drawn to those uh, more than others. And, um, you know, and then, you know, you can throw in current cases. The, uh, there's, a, there's a current case in this book um, that um, 
I, I was just inspired to write about because it's based on a true story. Um, you know, I changed like who was killed and so forth, but the the MacGuffin, if you will, that Bosch figures out for Mickey Holler is, is based on a true story, and I just love that. So I said, okay, I gotta I gotta use that in some way. So that was the contemporary story, and I'm always looking for uh, um, the cold case. And I, I think it, it, it's it's an interesting way to. Um give a different rhythm and a feeling of life and variation. I mean, it's, it, it's perfect for this structure. Well, I mean, your book, your most recent book, is also a bit of a time travel. So do you want to talk about, you know, your, uh, your book and, um, you know, why you chose that, um, that subject matter? I mean, I, I don't want to offend you. You're, you're very young. And, um, <laughs> and it just seemed like it would have taken a lot of research to kind of go back into the LA riots of uh, so long ago. And I'm curious about why you did that and, and how you did it. I'll keep this short because you're not here to see me. And I swear the cold case question was not a setup. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm Korean American and I grew up in LA. And you're right, I was six at the time of the LA riots. And um, so I only really learned about that as a subject when I was an adult. I was also living in um, the suburbs. I grew up in Encino. Um, but, you know, that was a time when um, Korean Americans were at the forefront of American racial politics for maybe the only time. It was certainly the, mo the peak time for that. Um, and so as somebody who writes about Korean American LA, um, I knew that I wanted to deal with that. But also, um, I, you know, the book is based on the Latasha Harlan's murder of 1991. And as I was doing research on that and um, deciding that I would write about that, you know, it was, I started that book in 2014. Um, I wrote, I spent four and a half years on this book. I'm like very jealous. I had, I had Michael sign a stack of my books in the back over there. And I feel like the first, the, the earliest of those books, I was probably working on this book. Yeah. So I'm very jealous of your output. Um, but, you know, it was around the time of uh, the Michael Brown murder and the, the Ferguson riots and, um, and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I just saw a lot of direct lines between early 90s Los Angeles and contemporary America. Um, and there were just so many reverberations that I really felt that I wanted to explore that. And so the book is contemporary, but it has deep roots in the early 90s. But I feel like so does everything that we're mm -hmm. living right now. Yeah, I don't know. Similar to that, when on the Bosch show, we wanted to uh, adapt a book I wrote in the 90s. It was um, kind of the book I wrote after having experiences during the riots as a journalist. And um, that was the book I wrote to kind of get it out of my system. And now, tw almost 20 years later, how do you uh, adapt that to contemporary Los yeah. Angeles? And it actually wasn't that hard because of the many things that, yeah, thematically, that you're talking it's, about. It's all still on the table. Um, so, actually, as long as we're on the subject of Los Angeles, um, you know, I'm personally committed to writing about this city forever, and you write very, very much predominantly about Los Angeles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, I, I don't think that's a misstatement. So, what, I, I'm from here, but what is it about LA for you that keeps you coming back? Um, I mean, I think it's a lot of things, but um, it's weird. I grew up in Florida but I was drawn to LA by fiction, um, mostly Raymond Chandler, mm -hmm. Ross McDonald, Joseph Wambaugh, and films and so forth. And um, so I didn't actually ever set foot in LA until I was 30 and I came for a job interview at the Times. And, um, and it was just kind of like what I thought it would be. And it was, uh, you know, I'd tried to write novels a couple times back in Florida, it didn't work. And I knew I needed to do some kind of shaking up of my life. And so I came out here and, and things seem to click, and so, you know, when things click, you go back to them. And uh, so I just kind of felt that somehow LA became my muse, and, um, you know, as a reporter, you're a quick study, um, you learn about a city in one year, what it might take someone five or six years to know, learn. Um, and so that was very helpful as well. And, you know, it's just the mixed bag of the city, all the, all the things that happen here, it's, uh, it's you know, I feel like as a writer, I have a, 
unfair advantage over writers who are, you know, writing about Houston or Pittsburgh or whatever. Um, in a way, it's not fair. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. You never you write. Know, a, you never run out of th stories to write about. You never run out of neighborhoods to write about. I right. mean, it's it's a. Uh, it's endless. Um, do Florida fans ever ask you, like, what the hell? Uh, yeah. I get that question a lot. <laughs> but, but. I mean, I had Harry Bosch go there on a case once, and that, that was enough. That should cover it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about TV, and, you know, you're spending, you spent a lot of time here, and, um, and uh, I learned back, I, I, um, you spend a lot of time in the writers' room for Bosch, mm -hmm. um, and so you're actually like there, like working all day while creating all these novels. It's really too much. Um, <laughs> but congratulations on the Lincoln Lawyer series, um, which was picked up this summer, right? Um, and uh, can you talk about your involvement in the film TV side of the Connolly Empire? <laughs> the. Uh that part of the empire. Um, no, I mean, I've, I've had, you know, good and bad luck in Hollywood over the years, but when it came to Bosch, who is certainly the character who brought me to the table, the character I've had the most longevity in, in my writing life, I wasn't gonna just, as I had in the past, hand it off mm -hmm. and say good luck and, and invite me to the uh, premiere. Um, I, wanted, I, I wouldn't make it any kind of deal unless I went with it. And I had a say, you know. I don't, I don't have any veto power over anything, but, um, but I have a say. And um, it, you know, it was lucky that it was Amazon because you know they have people that can punch a couple keys on a keyboard and figure out how many books of mine they sell, and that there, there could be a synchronicity here. So they, they, um, um, they, they wanted me involved, so that was good. I didn't have to yeah. push my way into it. They said, of course. And so it's worked out pretty good. And so I, I really have a, uh, a great gig because, um, you know, I wrote the book, so no one's going to fire me. And, um, and I can kind of come and go as I please. And, and, and what I've chosen to do mostly is be involved in the writing. I mean, the filming is great, and it's very egotistical to stand around and think like everybody here is here because of me. But I don't, I don't have anything to contribute in when it comes to camera angles and telling actors to, you know, whatever they're doing is right or wrong. I don't know enough about that. But I, but I know about writing about Harry Bosch, yeah. so, so I'm, I'm usually in the writing room. Um, and that all happens. Uh, you, we'll talk about you. You're in TV. All the writing happens long before the glamour of actually shooting anything happens. So it's, uh, you know, it's like a boardroom, and it's like six people and some assistants, and we hash it out and work out uh, 10 episodes. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a writer's room for the first time as a staff writer, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's so much more social than, I mean, actually, I, that's, that's an understatement because it's literally being in a room with the same people every day for 40 to 50 hours a week versus being alone with your dogs or maybe not even dogs for the same amount of time. So it's yeah. like very polar opposites, right? The, the kind of writing yeah, uh, I mean, lifestyle. It, it, I liken it to back when I was a reporter and I was in a newsroom. Yeah. Sometimes I was in bureaus that were smaller than what a writing room is. And there's a lot of, you know, collegial, there's pranking, there's joking, there's uh, a lot of talk of what, what's out there uh, culturally, and it's, and it's fun. And it is a big difference or a complete opposite existence from writing books where it's like you against your computer and that's it and no one can help you. Here you can bring up, in a writing room, bring up anything and, uh, and talk it out and, it, and it's fun. And, you, and you're, you said your daughter works on the show? Yeah. So uh, she's your coworker? Sort of. I, I, never, I never see her. She works in a different building from the writing room. She, oh, okay. She's smart enough to stay away from writers. <laughs> so. um, you, call yourself, you, uh, you called yourself a journalist at heart. Um, do you ever miss and reporting, or do you feel like it's all in here? Do you feel like the scratch is the same? Uh, itch? Yeah, I think it does exercise the same genes. Um, um, but what I mean is that I don't really, uh, I know there's people that go into that room with their dogs and totally create, and I don't. I, I, outside of that room, I cast a big net, and I spend time with the kind of people I want to write about, and I get their stories, and I 
change them a little bit, but um, I think if I have any kind of artistic genius, it's, it's knowing how to use stuff that's real, that I've gotten, not created, and, and put it into something um, in an order that I know, I mean, it takes skill and all that stuff, or talent, um, but, it, but at the end of the day, I'm not making up great stuff. I've, I've seen it, or I've reported it, and now I'm putting it into a thing that will be called fiction. I do think that is um, one of the most important skills you can have as a fiction writer, though, is the attention to detail, like choosing the right details and filtering, filtering in the, from all the world the story mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, putting, t choosing the important moments and putting into the story. You know, if that's not fiction writing, I don't really know what is other than, I guess, I don't know, laboring over prose. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I just maybe I'm an inferiority pro complex, but I just think that there's writers out there that you know don't spend any time in the real world. They just spend the time locked in a room, and what they come out with is is pretty beautiful. And, and um, I can read my books and go like, oh, I got that from him, and I stole that <laughs> from him, and this, and, you know, it's like uh, that. It's that's what I I look at when I think about my work. Well, you're an excellent thief. Yeah. Um, Some of my victims I see out there. <laughs> uh, I, wanna, I, I think um, you all have some questions which you wrote down before we came up here. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe we here, have about 15 come. minutes. Some of these. Some of these we're not going to answer. <laughs> um, have you done ride-alongs with law enforcement? What was your most interesting ride? I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do have an answer for that. Yeah, go ahead. But I, I did one, I've done one ride-along. I did one in Palmdale um, because a big portion of my new book is set in Palmdale, and I don't know Palmdale, and there aren't a lot of like bars or restaurants that you can go chill at. So I thought it would be a good way to um, get to know the neighborhood in a very quick manner, and it, it was. Um, I thought it, I thought it gave me the kind of access that I wouldn't be able to have, have just like driving through on my own. So I'm how sure did, you've done several more. So how did you get it? How did you get the right along? Did you know some? Somebody, or did you know a deputy, or what? No, I just applied through uh, the Palmdale, I don't know, Antelope Valley um, sheriff's, sheriff's office. Okay. Yeah, I just like submitted this thing, like because if you're a citizen, you can just do it. Like you don't have to be working oh, on a book or anything. I didn't know that. I've never had a ride on. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. You've never done one? And I I did a lot when I was a reporter. I did them all the time, but. Uh -huh. But I write about detectives, and you can't ride along with them. Yeah. You can have breakfast with them, and they're always hungry. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but, but I, I, I haven't done a ride along in a real, really long time. I did, I did one ride along. Um, this thing says any funny story or any interesting stories. Uh, I remember I was in a, a car uh, with a patrolman in Hollywood, and we're going down Melrose, and this guy frantically waves us down. And so we pull over. And um, he, all he wanted was directions. And then he looks at me, <laughs> and he goes, and you're Michael Conley. <laughs> so, so that was weird. Um, OK. Why did you incorporate Modesto, California, in the black box? Um, I, I mean, I think that should be kind of obvious. Um, you know, the story, you go where the story goes, and I needed Harry Bosch to go out of town. I had gone up there once on a, I think a trip to see uh, my brother-in-law, and I, I loved all the uh, pecan trees growing uh, out of water, and I just thought mm -hmm. that was a cool visual image, and behind them were the big, uh, uh, what do you call those things that spin and make power? Uh, windmills. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you, you live your life and you get inspired to do stuff. Um, Talk about why, why Palmdale. Um, I, I wanted to write um, about a black family that lived in, that used to live in central Los Angeles. 
that now lived in the exurbs because it's actually, since the early 90s, there's been a mass exodus of black people to the exurbs. Um, and I thought Palmdale was interesting because um, it's also a commuter city for LA. So there are all these people out there um, and, it's, and it's very compressed income. So it's all kind of lower middle class, like working class. Um, and it's 70 miles out, and so people live there so that um, they can have more real estate and then come drive in every day. And I thought there was a kind of dignity to that. Um, and, and yeah, I just, I just found it interesting to write about a place that wasn't like in the middle of the action, um, but where um, the main character could be pulled back in. You kind of just said in that answer why I really loved your book. And, you know, Los Angeles is uh, probably the most written about city in all of crime fiction. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, maybe yeah, New I York, so. I don't know. But it's, it's, like, it's like the story place to write about. And, you know, going back 100 years, people have been writing about this place. And your book had, you know, totally new places and, and new kind of... Um, sociological study of this place. And so um, it was, it, that's why I really liked it. Did anyone write that down? <laughs> <laughs> um, has your perception or characterization of Harry Bosch altered since the most excellent adaptation premiered on Amazon? No, I mean, because uh, we've talked about this. I, I've been in the writing room and um, you know, so the Bosch that's on the show, I have a big hand in, in, you know, creating or whatever you want to call it. He's different from the guys in the books. I'm, he's much younger. He, uh, the stories are contemporized, so they, that requires changes and so forth. Um, but um, it's, it's weird. I've been writing about Harry Bosch so long that the guy I built in my head cannot be dislodged. Titus Welliver is fantastic, I think, as Harry Bosch. But when I'm writing Bosch, I don't see him. I, I see the guy I've been writing about since mm -hmm. 1987. And uh, he's got gray hair now. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So yeah, that hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, kind of added to that is, is, and you know, since you're now working on TV, how do you think it, does it change the way you approach novels now, or will it change? I know you said you just started on it, but. Um, I hope not. Or, why, it, or why actually, would that you know, be a bad thing? Because, because I, 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 like, um, I like to think of the writer's room and my little space on my couch between two dogs as very distinct areas. Um, and there's just something, I don't know, I think, I think the, um, I took, the long, I took the long way for this book, and it's really the opposite of what you're doing in a writer's room, which is like beating the hell out of a story until it fits. Um, and, I, and, and I actually think this is an interesting and good way to approach story writing for, um, for television, which is a visual medium. But I've, I've noticed, at least in my room, you know, you think of like what's gonna be cool, and then you write towards that. And that's just never been how I write my books. Um, my books are very cool, let's, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I don't know. So I, I, want, I wonder about that. Um, but actually, there is stuff that I would like to take that I'm hoping will help me. The structuring, I think, is uh, very helpful. And then there's just the kind of asking every question at every step and um, trying to have like you know a few people in your head um, challenging you at every step of the way. I think that could be a positive. Um, but I don't know. So far, so far, um, I haven't tried going back to novel writing yet. But I hope that I can do it again, and that um, and that whatever my new method is makes sense for me. Are you really being sincere when you say I hope I can do it again? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to write a novel again. I, I, I'm in oh, that stage on. where <laughs> where um, I worked so long on this book, and now it's out there, and I'm thinking. Un until I have like a new idea that I get excited about, it's just really daunting. Um, and I used to be, I, I wrote three books in quick succession, but they all had the same protagonist. And now I'm, I'm kind of staring down the blank page again, um, and I haven't been able to like get back to it. There's something about each novel, even when I go back and read excerpts of my other ones, where I think, oh, like how did I actually like write that? Um, 
and I'm, I think I'm at that space now. But I'll, I'll figure it out. Eventually. By the way, her book's called "Your House Will Pay." I don't think I don't think we mentioned that, right? I think it was um, in the intro when we were in the back. Oh, okay. Um, well, that this one's like, what's next? <laughs> So you're not sure. Well, your next is we're working on a TV show. Do you want? Can you say what the TV show is? It's a. Uh, it's called Crime Farm, for now. Um, it's a. Uh, it's a, a streaming show that'll be on the air at some in undetermined future date on HBO Max. Um, it's. It'll be fun. I think. I think. I think it's going to be a good show. Um, it's hard for me to picture it from the scripts, but I'm excited. Uh, this one is. Uh, you're not going to answer what's next. Uh, I, I thought I did. I'm, oh, I'm writing about um, Jack McAvoy, the reporter. I'm writing a book about him next. Um, and then I'm not sure when, uh, like I said before, when I'll come back to Bosch or Ballard, but hopefully soon. Okay, this one is, please share if you see Bosch going out in a blaze of glory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sensing Bosch may make an exit stage left. Um, I, you know, I, it's weird. It's not a, it's not a real person, but I've, I've, uh, about half my life has been spent writing about the character. And, and you know, when you start out, you had, I had no idea. You know, I'd still be writing about him all these years later. Um, and so, when you don't know how long it's going to last, you, you know, you put everything into every book you're, you're um, writing. And so, Bosch has gone into had some a lot of trauma over the years and bad stuff happened, and so I really think in terms of, he doesn't deserve to go out in a blaze of glory, he doesn't deserve to die, and so I have no plans for anything like that. I think at some point he'll just kind of uh, move into the background and be, and mentor Maddie or mentor uh, Ballard or, you know, be around when he's needed. So, uh, Raymond Chandler used to say that uh, if you ever get stuck, have a woman come through, uh, have a blind come through the door with a gun. And uh, <laughs> if I ever get stuck in the future, I'll just have Bosch come through the door with a gun. <laughs> so. uh, this is about the show again. Did you ask specifically for the gentleman who plays Bosch? He doesn't seem quite right to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually did. Um, I did ask for uh, Titus. I mean, I shouldn't say I asked for him. I threw his name into the ring because I, uh, the big, you know, if you read these Bosch books, you know it's very internal and he, uh, uh, you see the world through his eyes and that's not what you can do in a script. Um, that's what we should talk about. Um, when you move from writing books to script, you know, you have, uh, you use a, lose a big piece of what makes a novel so interesting to write and read. Um, and that's the in internal thought. And, uh, you know, so we were going into the show and we didn't have that anymore. And, and you know, Harry's a very internal guy. And we had to find an actor who uh, could portray, you know, with his eyes, with his face, uh, you know, his, his actions and so forth, you know, the, the baggage that Harry carries. And so um, I saw Titus Welver in a show where he played a vet with uh, PTSD. And he just did it so well. I, I, you know, I didn't know anything else about him, basically. And I put his name into the hat, you know, basically when we were talking about casting. And eventually, he got the job. So, and his name had not been in the hat till I said that. So I was kind of proud about that. And this, and this book is dedicated to him. What's right? that? This book is dedicated to him, right? Yeah, yeah. About time, I guess. I should dedicate that to him. <laughs> He's uh, kept the show going for five years now. Um, how did you decide to give Bosch a troubled childhood? Um, you know, it's, when you're creating character, uh, the more normal a character is, the harder it is to write that character, I think, and make that character someone who connects with uh, uh, readers. I mean, we're all pretty normal but we usually read about people who have um, some kind of deficiency or some kind of troubled past or something uh, haunting them, and, and, and that's how we uh, connect uh, the, as readers to these characters. Yes? No? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, character comes out in crisis, you know, and, uh, and, in, and you can give depth to characters by just 
beating up on them. Um, and I have, I have found that with my books, that um, certainly my characters are more troubled than I am. Um, and, 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 it gives them, and it gives them weight, too. I think it, there's something about having some kind of trauma or something in their history that, that like really anchors them to the world in a way that readers can recognize. Um, will Bosch and his daughter ever work together? Um, yeah, no, that's the, um, that's the journalist in me that, you know, and, and the decision I made a long time ago to have everything move in real time. And um, I, I want Bosch and Maddie to, to work together, but it's, it's too soon. I want her to have um, some experience. She's only 22 in the books right now. And, I think she has, to make her more interesting, she has to live life some, have some experience, have some disappointments. And these things I haven't gotten into with her. And if I tried to write about them on equal footing, Bosch would just overshadow her too much. So that's something I got, you know, kind of in my back pocket. And uh, in the meantime, I have Ballard um, kind of filling that role of, of, of Bosch passing the baton to somebody. but. The times get passed again and again. So uh, hopefully down the road, I'm still writing, and uh, and and we'll see that story. I, I really look forward to it. So this is the basic, and you can answer this one because I've already answered it. What was what are your influences, inspirations in your characters? Um, you know, I covered all that with um, where Ballard comes from and where Bosch comes from, and what about you? You know, f funny thing, um, I also started um, writing because of Raymond Chandler. Um, I think, LA, man, you just have to tangle with Raymond Chandler. It's just, he's so dominant. Um, and that's how I got into crime fiction. Um, I read The Big Sleep when I was in college. And I just wanted to have a conversation with this guy um, who wrote about my city. And I wanted to write about my city the way that he did. And that's kind of how I got in. You know, this book is a little different. It's not a, it's not a mystery. It's a crime novel, but um, the, um, actually, the book that had the most influence on this one is probably Southland by Nina Ravor. Um, it's an excellent, excellent novel that, um, that covers um, the Crenshaw district between the 1930s and the 1990s, um, and it centers on, uh, on uh, four deaths during the Watts Rebellion. Um, it's really good, um, and it alternates actually between a uh, black man's point of view and a Japanese American woman's point of view. Um, and, and she's just a really great writer. Um, but yeah, I think reading about Los Angeles, reading a lot of crime novels, um, you know, I love, I love Michael's novels. Um, I love Richard Price. Like, I, I read widely in the genre, um, and I, I, you know, I steal a little bit from everybody too, um, even if I don't, even if it doesn't come out directly in the, in the writing. So this next one's just a comment, uh, but since we're in the neighborhood, it says, Bosch needs to try Casa Bianca the next time he is in Eagle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was from the owner of Casa Bianca. So, and the last question, Right, we're done, right? Close yeah. to being done. Um, what is the name of your favorite restaurant in LA and what is your favorite dish? Ooh. Do you have an answer to that? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, will, it will probably make people upset, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a meat eater, so I'd say Dan Tana's and the steak Helen, which is the small steak. Uh, I, I love Korean food, so off the top of my head, um, Jeonwon, J-U-N-W-O-N, it's a, it's a restaurant in Koreatown. They have a really fantastic braised cod that's spicy, um, that, and that I really loved when my mom made it when I was growing up. But that's just my spur of the moment answer. I'm sure I'll regret it in five minutes. Yeah, especially when they, you see your name attached to a blurb at the restaurant. <laughs> so, let's try the spiced cod. Cod. Okay. All right. I think we covered everything that we have in our time uh, allowed. And um, thank you. Thank you.